Um, so yeah, welcome. Thanks for coming to the basically the, yeah, the talk about one of the other big <laughs> uh, networks uh, of, of researchers running running studies together, um, which is called Many Babies, and it's a large scale replication effort with a particularly hard to reach and hard to test population, namely babies. Um, and I'm presenting this on behalf of the Many Babies Governing Board, uh, of which I'm a member. And Melanie Soderstrom kindly helped me creating these slides, but um, yeah, it's very early for her right now. So it's fine that I'm presenting. If you have any quick clarification questions, please feel free to just unmute yourself and ask them. Um, I won't be actively monitoring the chat. Um, so if you ask them in the chat, um, maybe someone else will just unmute themselves. And if you have more conceptual questions, um, that would be easier to discuss in the end. Um, so here we go. Um, yeah, testing infants, testing adults. I'm just assuming that you haven't really run an infant study yourself. Um, so we know, of course, there are some reasons that not all findings might be reliable, such as p-hacking, harking, etc. The same applies to infant studies. Um, so basically, I would say all of these limitations that we've been discussing in the literature have been also apply to infant studies. Um, but in addition, we're talking about a particularly vulnerable population. We're talking about a population that can't give informed consent themselves, that can't be um, yeah, properly briefed and debriefed, that can't be instructed. It's also difficult to recruit them. So um, you can't just go into uh, your campus cafeteria and just say, hey, would you like to earn five euros? Um, they also can't be motivated by money as easily. And they're generally not very compliant. Um, so one uh, of the consequences of all of these uh, things piling on on top of the, the general issues with, with experimental research um, in human yeah, and, psychologic, and psychological sciences is that we basically usually deal with very small samples and very noisy data, um, which is a great combo. So how bad is it? Um, this is a um, meta study of a bunch of meta-analyses on infant research up to three years. And um, this is just a count of effect sizes by bin and Cohen's D. Um, and so the typical meta-analytic effect size is quite small. Um, and that is coupled with a typical sample size of 20 participants per group. So in a within participant study, 20 participants in total, in a between study, uh, 40 participants. And I will need to make you smaller now. So that, and that's the, the average Cohen's D, not the median, the, the, the mean Cohen's D is 0.48. Um, so if you just assume a very simple t-test, um, that leaves us with power of 50 to 60, uh, 53 to 66%, um, depending on the kind of t-test, etc. cetera. Um, that's not great, right? <laughs> I think we all agree. So that's, that's one of the main challenges, the low power. And there are other challenges on top of that. Um, so Babies change a lot. This graph here on the right, um, if you can see my mouse, is uh, babies at 16 to 36 months, so around one and a half years to three years. And this is a standardized list of uh, how many words uh, babies are able to say. And we see, of course, there's a lot happening in just one and a half years. So it goes from nearly zero to almost yeah, ceiling. So this, this here is ceiling. Um, so babies know way more words. This is really just a, the snapshot from the list. Um, but also there are a lot of uh, big differences. So for example, if you ask uh, yeah, a language acquisition researcher like me, when is my baby supposed to say their first word? My answer would be any time before their second birthday. So it can be nine months, completely normal. It can be 19 months, still fine. Like there's a huge individual variation that we really have a hard time predicting and, and um, yeah, basically getting a good grasp on. And then there's also the environment interacting with all of these factors. So we have change over time, we have individual differences, and then we have environmental factors that interact with these. So here I'm, for example, plotting the same data, but split differently, namely by birth order. Um, and you can maybe see that, if you look very closely, um, that being a firstborn at later ages gives you an advantage. Um, but earlier on, actually being later born might be better. Um, some of these differences are actually reliable, at least uh, across uh, a bunch of analyses. 
And um, yeah, it's really interesting, basically, that that just just having an older sibling uh, affects how many words you're able to say um, in this particular example. So so this is just one example of environmental uh, differences, very likely interacting with individual differences and changing over development. So we're, we're looking at a complex system that has a lot of parameters. Mm. So this is our second challenge. And the third challenge is that, of course, we have technological advance advancements and um, we always want to improve the situation. So we want as infant researchers to get the best measure that we can. And um, so we basically always try to, to take um, the technological advancement and improve our methods. Um, so what people have been doing for decades and decades is this very simple design here where you really, all you need are some loudspeakers and some physical lamps that flash and they need to just be controlled remotely by a researcher so that the right lamp is flashing at the right time and the right speaker is, is uh, giving you the output you want. And then there's a little camera, like it used to be a real physical camera on a tripod recording infants uh, responses. Um, that's still in use. Then with the advance of, of screens that you could remotely control, um, we, you started having these, these nice displays where you can present, for example, two pictures on two screens, um, either at the same time or separately, um, coming on synchronously or asynchronously, again, having speakers that, that give you some sound and a camera that physically records babies' responses. Um, in the meantime, we've also invented eye trackers, so little infrared cameras um, that are remotely integrated in the screen, so they just really um, distantly record uh, eye movements. You might know these from adult research, so this is, this is something that uh, might be more familiar than these interesting booths here. Um, and there are also now studies, even with head-mounted uh, eye trackers, that, are, that have become so lightweight and so resilient to movement that we can actually now put them on babies' heads. I don't know whether you've ever done like a classical eye tracking study with a nice headrest. I would never dare to put a child below 12 or so in it for more than one minute. Um, so we can't use these, these classical eye trackers. So basically remote eye tracking and then lightweight head mounted eye tracking that can deal with movement of uh, innovations that, that really changed what we could do, what we could record and how we could run our studies. But do these differences matter? Is there a difference between having flashing lights, having pictures, having an eye tracker, um, just looking at the center, looking to the side, are all these things equivalent when we try to assess the same construct? Um, so are there method effects? And so on top of these baby specific challenges, of course, we have the, the uh, challenges that we share with, with um, that the, the, the PSA is also addressing that we share with psychology at large, is the lack of diversity at all levels, the lack of standardization, um, and um, the lack of implementation of, of open science and best practices. So this is really just happening right now, right? Um, so many babies is trying to address some, ideally all of these challenges in infant research. And the vision of many babies is to really implement a radically collaborative horizontal framework. So really not have one leader innovator that tells everyone what they should be doing, but really work together as a community. Um, and that also means that everyone can lead and contribute in whatever way works for them. Um, we're running large scale conceptual consensus based replications of seminal findings. Um, I'll get back to what consensus, consensus base means. Um, one of the goals is to identify sources of variability. So, right, we have these uh, infant uh, internal sources of variability. We have the environmental sources of variability. We have the methodological sources of variability. Can we at least get a grasp of on some of these? Um, and these, of course, provide boundaries of generalizability of specific data points um, that then can lead to more robust theorizing that, that tell us where and when we cannot uh, generalize from a specific finding. Um, and one of the goals is also to, of course, develop um, experimental best practices in infant studies, because as I, as I showed you, right, everyone has their own method, and actually these methods are implemented differently across labs. 
Um, then, of course, how we run studies differs and how we deal with any kind of result also differs. So really just getting an idea of what the best way to approach some of these, these variables is um, would be really helpful. And I put it last, but it's really not the least of our goals is to increase diversity of at all levels of researchers, of populations and of research questions. So how can you contribute? There are two ways to contribute. You can be a collaborator and contributor or you can lead. Um, so as a collaborator, you can sign up to support one of the big projects. Um, you, have, you have to commit to our core values and there is a code of conduct. And uh, you can then also rely on the community to support your involvement. For example, asking people for help in learning to program in R. And there are a lot of learning and growth opportunities. Again, for example, in learning more R. Um, if you want to lead a project, um, you can propose um, your idea to the governing board. And there's a form publicly available that just makes sure that people have thought um, really about what they're proposing, what it means to lead one of these large scale projects. Um, and that's really built from experience. And you can also propose a spin off or sister project. And what these are, I'll explain with examples in a bit. And then you have, of course, to coordinate among leadership teams. So I'll just jump right into the first Money Babies project. Um, if there are no urgent questions. <laughs> so this is a good moment to just basically ask a big picture question and allow me to just have a sip of water. So Many Babies One, <clears throat> the, the one big project, um, was called Many Babies or is called Many Babies One Infant Directed Speech Preference. And that's uh, been a good target for a first yeah, large scale um, infant uh, replication. Um, there have been many, many studies since the 80s, and there is a meta-analysis out there that has a, for infant studies, relatively large meta-analytic mean of Cohen's D, 0.67. And it's a very simple method that is nonetheless, or, or methods, actually, uh, as I said, we never just use one method, um, that actually um, has been used in, or is being used still in other studies. So that's really nice. Um, so what is this infant directed speech that Many Babies One was about? When I talk to you as uh, adults, um, I'm using a very different way of speaking than when I would talk to a child or an infant even more. So basically the younger the child, the more people tend to adapt um, their voice. So you would uh, say shorter things. The sentences I'm using right now, right? They're really long. I would say, yeah, things like, hey, you, you or can you say, ah, or this is a phone <laughs> and you would, um, yeah, as I automatically did, you would use a higher voice. So your voice would sound different. Uh, you would repeat more words. You would use different words even. Um, your pauses get longer and you actually make less errors apparently. Um, I still do, but it's fine. And um, this is a really base, uh, not basic, but fundamental phenomenon because it, um, actually has um, a lot of implications for um, language development. So it, it, it might be that the specific configuration of this way of speaking is actually making the signal easier to learn because language is actually quite complex. I'm happy to tell you more about that if you're curious, but um, just try to learn a new language, try to listen to, to a language you've never listened to before and you'll see what, what kind of problems babies are basically facing without the a prior experience and knowledge that we all bring to the task. Um, so maybe infant speech is a better signal for learning that's still being debated in the literature, or it's just because it's so nice to listen to and babies really like listening to it. But of course, to have this attentional advantage, we need to prove that infants prefer infant directed speech over adult directed speech, so over the way I'm speaking right now. Um, so that's really, it's really a solid foundation for a lot of theories. Um, of cognitive development and um, just want to make sure that we're, we're, we're hoping it's robust. Um, I see some things in the chat popping up, so I'll just have a quick look. Um, okay, nothing nothing dramatic. Uh, I'll just rely on Katya <laughs> to, to alert me if there's anything urgent happening. So how did this, this project proceed? Um, ah, 
So the idea for many babies at large uh, was, um, um, yeah, many babies in general, not many babies, one was, was had in, in 2015. And there was a general call for participation in December, among others via a blog post um, that I've linked here. And then in 2016, the people who have expressed interest in participating in many babies one, uh, in maybe many maybe, maybe well, many babies in general, sorry, <laughs> um, basically proposed different studies that could be the the first uh, attempt to run this kind of uh, research because we didn't know whether infant labs would be ready to run this kind of research um, as a group project, um, whether it's feasible even, whether people are interested. Um, and so we, we had people bring in ideas and uh, there was a vote and uh, infant directed speech was the best winner, basically. There was an, another candidate that, that was harder to implement. And so then things moved actually pretty quickly, I would say, from the decision in January. Um, we moved to the pilot in September to just release uh, with, with a finalized set of stimuli that had actually been uh, checked for being nice and interacted with, with, with an adult norming uh, sample. And we submitted the stage one registered report in December. And on top of everything, we wrote what we call the theory paper where we introduced the approach. So why should you actually run a many baby study? And that already contains the justification for the first many baby study being infant directed speech preference. Um, the register report was accepted in April, which I think is pretty fast. Uh, so December to April. And we started data collection right after uh, and had initially planned it for one year, but gave people um, uh, one and a half months extension because there were some delays due to ethics issues, et cetera, people setting up new labs. Uh, so data collection ran until June, 2018. So there, there was this, this one year of sort of quiet while we did have some discussions of implementation in Slack and via email, um, but mostly this was just waiting for the data to come in for, yeah, for everyone to just, um, yeah, invite babies and send us their spreadsheets. Um, and the first results and presentations then came quite quickly in 2018 in July because we had already committed to presenting at a conference. Um, but then it took more than another year because then you go through the results again, you make sure everything's fine, you check that, that your, your registered reports um, plans are being adhered to. Um, and so our final registered report acceptance came in September and we were officially were published in AMS in 2020. So four years, basically, <laughs> this is the rough time. And, and um, so, so to some of the features of many babies, um, I would just say this is much slower, I think, than a typical PSA study. Um, so what, what did I mean with consensus-based study design? Um, well, the goal was to, to derive the best test for infant's preference. Um, so that meant we shouldn't replicate a seminal study because um, between publishing the first study, for example, showing that infants like specific kind of speech, um, or showing another effect in infant research. And now, of course, we have all this methodological in innovation. We have emergence of new best practices. We have new insights from follow-up studies that some things might work better than others or new ideas coming into the literature. Um, so most people don't actually think, I would say that the seminal study is the best test of the phenomenon. Um, that makes the concept of replication a bit harder, right? It's a conceptual replication. Um, but it also gives us a, a nice um, ground for discussion. Um, and we involved experts that, for example, published the seminal study that have worked on this topic from different angles. And also people like me, junior researchers who'd never run an infant directed speech preference study, but um, I was still able to speak up and say, okay, this is um, maybe a good thing to do. Maybe this is a bad thing to do. Um, and I felt, at least I personally felt hurt. And I think that's pretty amazing. Um, there were a bunch of sticking points um, with this particular example. And I think there are always sticking points in this consensus-based study design because you can't just say so-and-so did it this way, right? Um, so for example, we didn't know whether there are method effects as I mentioned before. So the solution was um, to basically just use all the methods that had been used in the past, but limited to behavioral tests. So of course people also use 
cool electrodes and lights um, to measure babies' brain responses, but that is a whole different um, topic. There is a Many Babies um, spin-off project on using infrared light uh, to measure brain responses. Um, but yeah, and we should also, of course, use methods that are still being used and that are age appropriate. That was a whole discussion, basically, which methods are suitable, used and age appropriate. Um, and then this is a language study. And so, of course, the emerging question was, which language should we use for a global team and a global sample? Um, it's really very difficult to create stimuli that are comparable across languages. Um, then the question is, of course, do you create new stimuli for, say, collecting data in Australia, the UK, Nigeria, all of these countries, of course, do speak English, but they are different varieties of English. Um, still, we ended up using English. It's, a con it's again, a consensus. Um, it's a compromise. Um, because it was the only language where we actually knew that infants who had never heard English before actually showed the preference we were interested in. No other language had been tested that way. So really that meant going to the literature, also looking at our conceptual questions and really having a lot of discussion about what do we want to see? How can we make sure we see it? And how can we decrease the burden on the lab? And this actually also opens opportunities um, for new questions. For example, do you need to have heard Eng English um, to show this preference? And does this change over time? So as you age, of course, you hear more of your native language, you tune into your native language. Um, that's a really exciting opportunity, actually. We also compare procedures. Um, so we, or we do did compare procedures. So I just want to quickly show you the kind of procedures that we compared. So one is called central fixation, where babies really just look at a screen and there's a physical camera again and a, a physical experimenter coding whether babies are looking or not looking. So you see the nice button bo box here by this nice experimenter. Then of course we used eye trackers, which is basically the, the automated version of the same kind of procedure. And we used a, or what the lab had, the labs had um, versions of this uh, head turn preference procedure. So the three lamps that are flashing and then speech is coming from the side and we check whether the baby's looking to it. Um, so basically two central screen-based methods and one that really involved head movements. And this is the big distinction you need to keep in mind. So what did we end up doing? I want to say we were overwhelmed with the response to the first Many Babies project. It was amazing. In discussions beforehand, this, this number of 20 contributing labs um, was, was, was being put out and we were like, oh, oh 20, that's really ambitious. Um, turned out, 69 labs submitted data. So we really, really, yeah, met our target and then some. Uh, 2,754 babies were tested for this study. And uh, we could, in the final analysis, include 67 labs with 2,329 babies. So that's two orders of magnitude larger than an average infant study. <laughs> I think that's pretty amazing. Um, so that, what did we do with that? We asked labs to basically convert whatever kind of output they had into a summary score. That's, so that's already completely anonymized. We did not ask labs to submit video data. As I mentioned, right, um, most of these methods actually do record video. Um, but we really asked them to just um, fill in templates that, that have summary scores. Um, then we asked labs to upload these, these filled in templates with participant and trial information. Um, with, well, video, submitting videos with optional if their ethics allowed it, some information about their ethics and um, what we call a walkthrough video that I'll explain later. And then pre-processing started on the central side. Um, check whether everything's there, check whether everything's complete, check whether everything's really fitting the template. For 69 labs, that's a lot of work. Um, Try to read it all into R, fail, go back to the files. <laughs> um, we had everything. We had Excel automatically uh, changing uh, numbers to dates. We had um, labels differing between files. Um, we had format issues. So um, funny thing about European versus US um, CSV files is that some use commas and some use uh, semicolons because the comma is... Uh, has a different meaning in European math. Uh, we use it to, to um, 
distinguished fractions. So what, what you use a period for, we use commas for, so you can't use CSVs in Europe. <laughs> it's, yeah, um, it's fun. So basically there's a lot of back and forth that started. And that's why it took more than a year to go from the first uh, rough analyses to the final registered report. Um, we also, of course, excluded babies, as you saw, 500 babies were excluded. Um, we needed to harmonize uh, variables because um, what is counted, for example, as a premature baby differs by country. That's really interesting. Um, and yeah, we generate the final data set and we fit pre-registered models and had two kinds of models. One was, um, GL, was, one was a GLM and we had to remove some random effects for convergence issues and one was a meta-analytic approach. So if you look at the paper, you see two streams of analyses, um, which I think is an interesting approach as well. So what did we find just quickly? Do infants actually show this preference? I, I think you've been really excited to hear. The answer is yes, we were really relieved. It's there, <sighs> but the effect size is much smaller than we had expected based on the meta-analysis. Um, there is a follow-up in progress happened to be led by me, so I'm happy to tell you more about that as well, where we compare the actual meta-analysis to the many babies data. Um, then I talked about development. Yes, there is an age effect. Actually, baby's preference gets bigger as they get older. Um, and does language matter? So does being exposed to the stimulus language make a difference? Yes, um, there's a larger preference. And finally, does method matter? Again, yes, just follow the blue, orange, and red line. You see they're different. Um, but you also see the variance, right? Every dot is a lab, a dot size is participant sample size. Um, but yeah, we do have method effects on top of everything else. So this lamp-based method with the three lights uh, generated on average a bigger effect size than the two screen-based methods. We also explored the data and there's still room to explore so much more. Uh, so for example, does it matter how strict you are in cleaning your data? Um, in, the, in these analysis that I just presented, babies had to complete one trial per condition. That's really low, right? No adult study would ever just include one trial per condition. Um, and it turns out that yes, the stricter you are, the better you are. So these are the analyses um, that we did were pre-registered and we had a really high inclusion rate. So 98% of one of the screen-based methods um, participants were included, but the effect sizes were quite small. So if you up that from uh, two out of 16 trials to four out of 16 trials, um, you of course lose way more participants, but your effect size is systematically increased. And eight trials is really just 50% of the total number of trials babies could complete, um, but your effect size is really um, increased. But yes, um, so you can for eye tracking only include a third of your participants. So that's of course not very encouraging. Uh, turns out, by the way, if you look at the literature, when people report their minimum number of trials, it's more like 80%. So the, the highest number I'm looking at here is 50%, just a reminder, so, which is really strict. Um, so what does many babies give us apart from these uh, results? We have an OSF with all the materials shared, lots of procedure documents, um, administrative um, forms. There's a whole separate project on, on creation and norming. And um, the GitHub repository with all the anonymized data that you can use for your follow-up studies. And of course the paper. Um, but there's more. And I wanted to quickly explain what parallel projects are. So Many Babies Bilingual is one of those parallel projects. Um, because, yeah, I'll, I'll explain why. But so what happened was really very quickly after the decision was made to test infant directed speech preference. The idea came up to also have a parallel project on bilingual babies. And um, the registered report was accepted quite fast after the many babies, one registered report and data collection really followed very quickly. And we could actually start collecting data before the registered report was accepted because it was really locked to many babies um, one. And yeah, it's also published. <laughs> uh, there it is. 
that's me. <laughs> so um, yeah, I think it's a great project. And um, why would you want to have this kind of parallel project? Actually, if you look globally, most children learn more than one language. Most of us learn more than one language. This is not my first language I'm speaking in. And I'm living in a country that also doesn't speak my native language. So yeah, I speak more than three. <laughs> um, nonetheless, uh, language acquisition research particularly is biased towards monolingual babies because it's just so much easier, right? Um, I myself am, am really mostly studying monolingual babies, but how does it generalize, right? Um, so just, just for reasons of representativeness, you should study bilingual babies if you study babies. Um, it also gives us interesting opportunities that we could look more closely at the exposure effect that we didn't know would happen. We, we thought, okay, that might, might happen, but of course we could predict that it was there um, because we only had significant, non-significant kind of results from previous studies. Um, but yeah, bilingual babies and why people don't test them, they're even harder to recruit. Um, no two bilingual children are alike. Um, it's very hard to find a very homogeneous population. There are some bilingual countries where you might find more homogeneous babies, but then for example, family composition might differ. They might move, they might change schools. Um, yeah, it's really hard to find like match samples as we like them. And um, it's also really not clear what it means to be bilingual. Is it enough to have a grandma that speaks another language to you and you see them once a month? Are you bilingual already? Most people would say no, but you do have exposure to another language. It might already change something. And how many languages you need is also, of course, an important question. So bilingual babies allowed us to look closer at the exposure effect I mentioned. And uh, if you look at the red line, that's really how much North American English, so the stimulus language babies heard um, in daily life being yeah correlated with how big their preference was so they do like the uh, they do show a bigger effect again if they hear more north american english so that's really showing that it's not um yes and no it's not a, a binary kind of effect it's really a graded effect so the more you're exposed to a specific um stimulus language the more in in lab you show a preference so this is what we call a parallel project there are also yeah, spin-off projects that were not as tightly linked or, or usually not as tightly linked to the main data collection. And there's, for example, the development of gaze following. So in monolingual and bilingual infants, that's also published. There is this, uh, a follow-up that really invited the same babies back into the lab, which is something we rarely do, um, but it's actually really important. Um, and that's actually being written up. And the results are really exciting, actually. Um, there is a longitudinal follow-up. So does this kind of preference actually predict something about language acquisition? Uh, the stage two register report uh, is, yeah, we're working on it. <laughs> then this, this comparison with the meta-analysis that I mentioned before, um, I'm working on it. <laughs> we're all working on it. Um, there's a, a specific, um, effort to extend the sample to Africa. I don't know whether you saw on the map, but um, we have a very biased sample again. So there was a, there's a specific uh, effort that, um, yeah, collects data uh, in Africa. And the first babies in Ghana have just been tested. I got the email yesterday. Um, very excited about that. And then there is a follow-up that really looks at trying to actually recreate this experiment in different languages that really also shines a light on how difficult it is to match stimuli um, at um, the, the, the procedure and, and the norming across languages. And that's uh, sadly on hold due to the pandemic. But these are all spin-off projects. It's just to highlight, that, so the content is not as important as the diversity, to highlight how much we've been doing with this one many babies project. So it's really different groups of reach researchers looking at this main project and having very different ideas how we could actually deepen our insight based on what we could learn from this one main project. Um, so this was many babies one. If you have questions about it, I'll just quickly check the chat. 
<laughs> they get friendly comments about yes. how amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thanks for the nice words. I saw some nice words in there. Um, and I saw questions. Uh, yes, yeah, so, yeah, so basically, it's whether, whether it's expected when studies are replicated that the effect size is smaller. Well, it's yeah on average right if you if you compare meta-analysis to to a large-scale replication there was a paper by Quaren et al that kind of um, yeah um, fueled this this comparison that, that we're working on that says yes on average you you're finding a much smaller effect um if any um but um there's something specific about many babies one because of feasibility we tested on average older babies um so that changes the effect size. We tested uh, different methods than, than are represented in the literature. We tested a more diverse population, way more babies with this non-native stimuli, which we saw lowest effect size. So there are a bunch of reasons to expect that actually all of these decisions that were made in many babies won moderate effect size. Turns out if you all put it in a statistical model, it turns out that that's not the case. It's very interesting. So we have theoretical reasons to, to expect that for example, the age difference, the native language effect, um, all um, work towards a bigger difference between meta-analysis and many babies. When you put all of these as predictors in, the difference gets bigger. It's very counterintuitive. I'm happy to chat more about this, but yeah, in general, it's, um, so we basically, we need to just understand better what these replications mean. Um, but I, yeah, I do think, um, meta-analyses and, and large-scale replications aren't the same thing anyways. <laughs> so um, yeah, again, but I wanted to talk more about many babies. Um, so what other many babies projects are there? There's many babies too, which is about infant theory of mind. What is that? It's the ability of me to think that you think. Um, and when does this emerge? Some people said, okay, around four years, it's when people, or when babies, or children uh, explicitly reason about others people other people's knowledge and thoughts but maybe it starts much earlier uh, in infancy so really in the first and second years of life and that's being tested more indirectly so you can't ask them to explicitly reason before they start saying anything about what a doll knows for example so what they're doing is really show babies these amazing stimuli um, that have been that have taken a long time to construct and a long, long, lot of debate. And um, basically, for example, here, the mouse is uh, going to one of two boxes. Uh, see, and the bear sees him, the mouse sees that the bear sees him. Mouse is jumping into the box. Now the bear is trying to follow. So where do babies look and think the bear will come out? And he's coming out at the same time. So that's basically the test, right? So it's reasoning about what the bear knows. Then there are other conditions about, um, for example, the bear quickly vanishing and the mouse switching locations. So can babies suppress the knowledge that the mouse switched location and do they distinguish their own knowledge from the bear's knowledge? Um, it's quite complex, right? But yeah, can babies do this? We don't know yet. <laughs> the debate is not. And it's it's quite the, the, the interesting. Um, finding. Oops, I didn't want to play this again. There's also many babies three rule learning, which is about um, us being able to construct or detect patterns. Um, again, this is uh, done in speech, but it's also been shown in the visual domain and the action domain. So it's really about can we, for example, after hearing words that that follow this ABB pattern, can we with new words, uh, just detect that they follow the same rules and um, show a difference to uh, words that, that show an ABA pattern. Um, so basically, do we show a difference response to Lonini versus Lonin Lo? Um, the register report has been submitted. There's also many babies for and social evaluation. You might notice that it's been going back in time. It's because the many babies three has been has been seen through some, some updates. Uh, social evaluation is also an interesting ability. It's been shown with this nice paper here um, that where 
there's a little circle, a little triangle, and uh, the triangle helps the circle up. And there's a square that actually pushes the circle down. And then which one do babies prefer? So do babies actually like helpers um, more than hinderers? And then there are social and non-social uh, dimensions. Um, the registered report has been accepted at developmental science, which is a very nice journal in our field. And then there's many babies five, very recent on infant attention. Um, because we don't really know why infants sometimes prefer something that have, they have experienced before, and sometimes they prefer something they haven't experienced before. There are some models of this. Um, so you might see this result and this result, uh, or you might expect this result and you actually see this result and you can't really exactly say why. There's this very elegant model it's by Hunter and Ames um, that we're basically testing in this experiment. Uh, in this yeah, Many Babies uh, project and it's being, we're, yeah, we're working towards stimuli that can actually test this. Uh, there's a question by Lisa oh. about yes. uh, whether each, each collaborating lab usually involved, uh, is each collaborating lab usually involved in all the MB uh, projects or just one or a few? Sorry, I just need to get out of the chat. You know what, I will show you so usually uh labs are involved in more than one project um so we have this nice collaborator dashboard that is a shiny app i hope it works on this computer i haven't tried it in a long time um and it has all the labs that have signed up and so if we zoom in for example here to the netherlands i don't know why i would write um this is us and you see which studies we're involved in i don't know whether you can see this i hope you can so um we're involved in many babies one many babies one bilingual many babies at home many babies three and many babies five uh and here the uh, university baby lab is also involved in many babies too so that's just one example, right? So usually there are different steps, but some are also involved in just one. So it's really, you can explore. It's really nice. So Lida, for example, is co-leading Many Babies 3, but they also contributed to Many Babies 1. Um, can I ask a follow-up question? Yes. Uh, so does a lab need to be involved in data collection to be part of many lab, a many lab that can it be um, on? any other stage of the process? That is a very important question. And I'm very glad you're asking it because um, I we're trying to make it very clear, but it's not always um, easy to make clear that um, there are any kind of contribution is welcome. So right, uh, this kind of project has so many moving parts where we need help um, from creating stimuli to documentation, to data analysis, to data, yeah data cleaning even, and um, any contributions welcome. So people don't need to have access to babies. They don't even have to have a first idea about testing babies to be able to contribute. Um, maybe Many Babies at Home is also a good example because here we're actually also working a lot with programmers, with AI researchers, um, because we want to not just rely on lab data, but also, for example, have people participate via their own computers. Um, that needs a uh, specific technical knowledge. It needs um, things like anonymization. So people who do um, video processing are really, really important. People who know more about ethics are really important. Um, data sharing, automated um, coding of what babies are doing um, would be a great feature, but we're not there yet. Um, so all of these things do not mean that you test babies um, on top of creating stimuli, working on documentation, writing, um, and all the data, the part of the data pipeline that also, right, that was after testing babies, this whole pipeline, any contribution there was extremely valuable because it was so much work to just go from the data to the final paper and the GitHub repository. And both of these need a lot of work. Um, and that's, I think, also one of the big bottlenecks to, um, 
yeah, to find enough people that work on the non-testing baby parts. <laughs> Uh, just another follow-up, someone asked in the chat, where can I find the list of the tasks you, you need help with online? Um, usually uh, we recommend to get in touch with the leads. So on the Many Babies website that I'll show you in a second, that's on my last slide, um, there is uh, links to leads, to the slacks, uh, if there is a slack, to the mailing list. And um, we recommend to get in touch with the leadership team um, and see where you can um, chip in. So there will be, for example, task forces being being made. People can sign up to say, I'm really interested in helping with writing. I'm really interested in helping with analysis. Um, but also when the time comes for analysis, there will be new calls um, through the mailing list and or Slack, um, whatever mode of communication is particular to this project. And um, people will be very welcome to help out usually. Um, so this is, this is yeah. This is maybe one of the challenges also to, yeah, to make sure that everyone can contribute in the best way. Let me just go back to the slides. Uh, we also have a demographics group um, that's working towards unified demographic forms. If you've ever tried to collect data, say on ethnic uh, ethnicity um, in more than one country, you will know that this is hard. <laughs> So try to ask, say, a German whether they're white. Um, most Germans don't have these kinds of categories. Caucasian is really bizarre for us, by the way, because Caucasia is really far away from here. None of us is Caucasian. Um, so just to give you an example, um, I don't know, is Caucasian even used? Uh, but yeah, so, so there are very different categories that, that are being used. And um, yeah, very different discourse about, for example, ethnicity. Um, Socioeconomic status is another one of these, right? What makes you high, mid, or low SES differs by country, by actually economic system, by the kind of social security you have access to. Um, so how do we deal with this? And I'm very happy that there are people working on this because I don't know the answer to these questions. Um, so what makes Many Babies unique? Um, we're trying to do it all, basically. We're trying to test key theoretical phenomena and boundary conditions um, and um, yeah, unite this with methodological innovation and improvement by, for example, using consensus-based designs, by using what we call walkthrough videos, by explicitly actually studying methodological effects. Um, we have spin-off projects to answer more questions to give more people the opportunity to lead without the, the challenge of actually being the lead of a main project um, and to develop consensus-based best practices. So really how can we work with this very vulnerable population? Um, and I call this the opportunity to explore open science with a safety net because there will be other people checking your work and um, make sure that you don't share sensitive data. And it's, yeah, the idea is that we're really as collaborative as is possible. I wanted to mention walkthrough videos. So these are actual videos that labs took of their procedure. And you will see that for data protection reasons, there are no actual babies here. This is a teddy bear, this is a little doll. Um, but this allows us to have a much better idea of the subtle differences in implementations um, that we really came to appreciate um, during this project. Um, so, some people, for example, use lamps in this in this booth setup that I mentioned. Some people use screens. Some people use these kinds of reflector thingies. Um, does this matter? We don't know yet, but we have the walkthrough videos. So if anyone wants to run a follow-up analysis on this, we can. And that's much more than we could say before. These videos have also been amazing during the pandemic because we had basically two cohorts of students not being able to visit baby labs. So we could just show them the, the walkthrough videos and at least give them an idea of all the steps involved in testing a baby. Um, and it also yeah, helped with, with this open science with a safety net. Um, we did an exit questionnaire with contributors. Um, so every lab got one questionnaire. We got 65 out of 69 labs to respond. And 50% uh, of the people said that they will adopt more open science practices. 
um, which I think is fantastic. So people are really more open to registered reports, pre-registration. Note that this is from 2018. So the number might have increased in the meantime. It might actually be an interesting meta-scientific study to follow up on the long-term effects of participating in these kinds of uh, large-scale collaborations. But yeah, there are still challenges. Um, diversity, as I mentioned, right? So we have many babies from Africa because we had no African lab uh, contributing. Um, and we also have very little diversity in the leadership teams. Um, ethics is a huge challenge. How do we share data? How do we collect data together? Um, bilateral collaboration agreements are a thing, but they're not feasible for these kinds of large scale um, operations. Um, how do we also deal with the fact that participants cannot consent? Um, to sharing their data, but then they grow into an age that they can consent. So they're not forever unable to consent. Um, and of course, how do we fund this? Um, and this is actually directly linked to diversity, but it's also key for making this whole thing sustainable to make sure that things are there in 10 years, that things are well documented because if we don't have money um, and people just contribute their time as they can, um, things like documentation is really one of the things that that is just not um, yeah, done as well as it should be, I think, because we're really, we're not rewarded for it um, with papers and such. So one of the ways to address these ongoing challenges is the network of networks, um, which got funding, <laughs> yay. And uh, this is among others with the PSA. So I invite you to join the session 3B later today. Um, You'll see me again and uh, yeah, talk about how we can bring different large scale collaborations together and um, basically improve how, how we do this kind of research. So there's the Many Babies website if you want to find out more. And um, I can also paste the link to the slide slides in the chat. So I'll stop sharing. So I see you all again. Hi. Ah, there's the things, there's the website and the slides link. You are all free to unmute yourself and just give yes. some claps. Uh, uh, just. This is the slides link. <laughs> Thanks. And the sun really came out. I, I did not expect that. So I'm, I, I'm sorry that I'm this dark figure now. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was wonderful. Um, feel free to unmute yourself if you want to ask anything, but if you can't, I can um, be your voice in the, in the chat room. I also see the chat now that I stopped sharing. Hello, everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi. Uh, uh, that's great. The work that you've been doing in many babies, all of them are great because uh, I, I, I know a little bit about developmental psychology and the experiments they should uh, they run in that field and the uh, lots of considerations that you should uh, take for uh, experimenting with babies and uh, your work was great. Uh, I really love your presentation and the work you, you've done, especially about the theory of mind uh, experiments. Uh, and um, I, I try my best to just uh, check your website and see whatever I can do for you, you know. Uh, nice. I just enjoy it a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the kind words. Yes, um, I'm not um, sadly uh, so involved in Many Babies uh, 2 Theory of Mind. Uh, it's an amazing project, though, and they just launched an online spin-off um, in collaboration with Many Babies at Home. Um, where you can also sign up separately. And um, I'm just thinking, yeah, I think if you contact the leads, they can point you in the right direction. So depending on yes. what you want to do, but yeah, you don't need access to babies. There are different ways to contribute from writing to yes. uh, data analysis, to simulations, to even modeling uh, spin-offs. Yes, yes. The data actually and the details we've gathered from all those uh, experiments, I think, are very valuable. And 
the baby's reaction, the baby's uh, eye tracking, and uh, the change, the differences between different uh, cultures. Uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, listening to her talk about those things. Thank you. Thank you. That's very nice. Um, great. Now, happy to answer more questions. Um, I see Lisa raising her hand or... Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so PSA and many babies share a lot of, um, of issues. I was wondering what, have you guys ever thought about um, becoming your own data repository? And that, like, there's so many challenges to ethically holding data, but you could give all the data to an established data repository. Could you become one and yeah. manage it yourselves as an organization? The issue is funding. And, and mm -hmm. like one word, it's funding. But yeah, we basically, it's especially for online data collection, it's a huge challenge, right? Because then you start having also disconnect between participant location, lab location, server location. So it makes everything even harder. Um, if yeah, there was- international diversity in um, laws about everything. privacy. <laughs> yeah, it's a nightmare. And I mean, you being in the UK, you you know GDPR and you know data exchange, et cetera, right? And you've been, I think you're still following GDPR and and yes. at least for now. <laughs> and and it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's fun um, to say um, mildly and just also with collaborators and across, um, like if we were to collaborate and want to exchange data, we would have to enter a bilateral contract, like proper legal contract, right? And it basically takes sometimes a year between universities to figure these kinds of things out. So that's not feasible for this kind of project. Um, yeah, so having a separate entity would be nice. Um, what we're doing um, in part with Many Babies at Home is work actually with Lookit, which is a separate entity that, that um, requires all labs who collect data to enter an agreement with them because they store the, the video data, which are by definition sensitive data. And um, so that, that's nice. And another project that also wants to collect video data is basically making the lead institution the data host. Um, because yeah, we don't have funding for anything that is central to many babies right now. And there's, if yeah, if many babies were an organization with funding and and, technical staff, etc. then it might be feasible. But of course, you also want to have long term um, equipment yeah, funding, etc. right? Yeah, dedicated long term funding is absolutely essential for some of this. Yeah, so that's why, yeah, look, it is a great um, um, opportunity because they're at MIT. So <laughs> MIT will still be there in 10 years, I hope. <laughs> and um, the institution of one of the leads is also a good solution because they are there with a permanent contract and not not a poor postdoc like me <laughs> will be gone and um, might lose access to their data. <laughs> so I mean, they, people move all the time. Yeah, so that's true. An institutional repository isn't always the best idea either. Yeah, that's true. I don't know I what think, the best is besides, yeah. besides governments giving us a lot of funding. Yeah. I mean, governmental repositories, right? That might be another option. But I think this is actually one of the things we need to keep talking about between PSA and Many Babies, um, because maybe we can join forces <laughs> about then find find a way to find a a solid, safe and uh, accessible repository, or find someone who already has it and makes it usable for us. I mean, it's a generic problem for all of the the yeah. many um, international collaborations is how do you internationally share and store sensitive data? Yeah. And that's why um, some the solution for Many Babies One was really give people a template that is has minimal sensitive data. So for example, instead of birth dates, um, we collected age and days, which completely removes any 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 personal information. It, it was just summary data. There were no videos involved, et cetera. So it was in principle, um, anonymized or depersonalized, right? These are different legal terms that I'm still mixing up um, but yeah it's yeah so anyone in Europe who's been facing GDPR knows the, the struggle <laughs> and yeah it's yeah it's it's going to it's only going to get worse in, in quotation marks if we if we rely more on online data collection um, if we rely more on different tools like like 
AI, how do you train AI, right? If you if you want to use really face coding, you need diverse training sets, etc. Or if you want to have different different kinds of, of annotation tools, um, it just explodes with with the technical possibilities. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's fun. It's yeah, it's, it's a hard problem we haven't solved at all. But yeah, it's yeah. Also, just who 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 owns the data, right? Just yeah. ownership. Um, yeah, one of the things we're thinking about is also having collaborator agreements, at least um, that are not legally binding, but at least give us a basis for reasoning. But yeah. <sighs> Sorry, <laughs> so you, you touched upon a point that really gives me gives me headaches, actually. <laughs> But it's yeah. I keep I keep going back to the idea that many babies should be should be some kind of institution in itself, and PSA as well, some kind of nonprofit or so. And then are you applying for nonprofit or charity status? Not as far as I know. Does PSA? Yes, we're, we we oh. we're not yet, but are in the process of figuring out how to do it. That's interesting. <laughs> Interesting, interesting. Yeah, I will, I will, yeah, we will follow up, I guess. <laughs> yeah, we might, I might bring it up in the panel. Might ask Nicholas about it. Yes, I think there are, there's barriers, but like our, um, is it like donations made through Patreon? I think Chris Sharty had to pay taxes on those. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so. It has some advantages to be like a, a legal entity and it makes these bilateral agreements easier because then they don't have to be between the whole network, but they can be just mm-hmm. between data collection site and the entity. Because mm-hmm. otherwise you would have to have a network agreement. Yeah. I'm wondering if like becoming an entity more formally might also help with some of the ethics issues. Yeah. About like if you could become an institution that could grant ethics. Yeah. Or, or is that an ethical problem in and of itself if we're a network of people? But like psychology departments are this. A psychology department yeah. is a network of people who are authorizing their own ethics, right? Yeah. So. Um, it, yeah, I don't, I, I want to say, I, I, I want to say it makes it easier because right, you can get ethics to go elsewhere and collect data. So I could, I could, get ethics and then take my little laptop to France and ask people to press buttons, I guess. <laughs> um, so it might make these these aspects of things easier as well. Um, yeah, <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's who, who owns it, who runs it, um, that, that's a whole separate question, how, who funds it? That's the big question, right? Mm-hmm. But yeah, we haven't even, thought about donations to many babies so so far it's been really basically people donating their time and their energy but not actual money yeah do you have anything that costs money um so we got small grants for example to reimburse participants and um we have an executive director and we have general generous donations of people's t- um people employing staff and the um, the network of networks grants also gives us some admin. Like that, just yeah, it's just. I mean, it's been people trying to keep track of things unsuccessfully, and just helping with that is great. But there's yeah, so participants cost money. But in principle, things like server storage, etc., costs money. Um, but yeah, translators. Yeah. So yeah, no, a lot of wrote down all of the volunteer stuff that was going into mm. these big projects. Um, yeah, we'll be shocked how much like actual yeah. monetary value it has in terms of volunteer yeah. hours. I think we should. I think that would be uh, actually but, really. But who's really... got the time for that? Yeah, exactly. Right. We need. We need. We need admin support to just start doing this kind of inventory. Just an inventory of of. Yeah, the labor has gone into many babies. One that would just be 
the number of, of, of student assistant hours, the number of, of setting the experiment up, right? Um, scheduling participants cost time and money, participant databases cost time and money, participant reimbursement. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to know. <laughs> no way. But just, just putting a number on, on, on many babies, one would actually be really impressive on, on a PSA project, on, on all the voluntary time that went into it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I bet it would be a big number. Yeah. All right. I want to take up all your time with like generic <laughs> administrative questions. Maybe people have yes. questions. Otherwise, you can also contact with me or the board or others. Maybe I just I have, have a, a ah, yeah. okay. yeah. yes. Uh, I just uh, had a short comment. Uh, I'm completely impressed by this project. I heard so much about this project, but I never was thinking even uh, being part of it because somehow I thought I must collect babies that data. Yeah, but I, I don't have any access to babies. And I was pleased to happy to know that it's possible without having uh, this population. Uh, what I wanted, uh, what I'm also think it's very interesting about bilingual because you said uh, there are like some children, is there this heterogeneity of those who speak two languages? Uh, so how do you think, uh, would it be possible to uh, control for socioeconomic status? Because in many countries, those children who speak two languages are usually uh, children of, of their parents moved to this country and uh, uh, those who were born in this country, they speak usually only one language, their own language. And this is of course a co-found. And I wanted to ask how, how you think you would even address this question? I'm just curious how to control for such, for such variables. Yeah, it's a great question. So um, socioeconomic status, right? Is one of these, these issues with, with many babies demographics. Um, and I also want to mention, at least in Germany, right, we have um, posh parents who send their babies to bilingual preschools, for example, because being bilingual in specific languages is, is high status. So, um, yeah, he, me being a German in the Netherlands, it's, it's a high status second language or a high status bilingualism that, that I have. But if I were to come from another country, then it would be low status bilingualism. So it's, it's, it's kind of confound and actually, yeah, people are more likely to learn say German than other languages um, or even have them offered, right? So they are, they're English, for example, they're English daycares in Germany and they're really popular and they are not for expats. Um, so that's, that's <laughs> one additional info, but also just measuring socioeconomic status or, um, what we call in Germany, we call it migration background in the Netherlands as well. Um, that that also might might actually get at that question, like folks, or or the question who's speaking the second language? Is it is it one of the parents? Is it one of the main caregivers? Or so so you can get at this different ways. So for example, having what's really common here is actually having a German mother and a Dutch father. It's, it's weirdly this way around somehow. It's, it's, it's I don't know why. <laughs> what's with the Dutch men? Um, <laughs> really, I have, yeah. I have <laughs> numbers and people really trying to recruit German Dutch bilinguals really found this family constellation overwhelmingly. Um, but yes, they're, they're um, you have some homogeneity and, and a, usually a high socioeconomic status, um, but some, migration background um but yeah, it's yeah it's it's, it's a multi-layered problem that is really hard to get at and um even if you say have a german mother and a dutch father uh, those mothers might differ in their knowledge of dutch um the fathers might differ in their knowledge of german they might have had german at school they might have actually themselves have a german parent um so yeah it's really mixed um even within these these apparently homogeneous populations um, so yeah, bilingualism, it's a whole thing. <laughs> and I want to mention, so um, I want to check actually whether many babies bilingual um, controlled for SES, because I do remember, tr we, we tried in many babies to get some 
um, SES data by using basically a letter where people would put themselves. And um, let me just, because it's been a long time since I looked at the analyses, have been involved in those, but ooh, it's been, it's been quite something. So let me just quickly check. Mm. And we did not put them in the analysis, probably, because it was quite tricky. Oh, here it is. Uh, yeah, the Linux effects model examining SES as a moderator for monolingual bilingual differences. I'll quickly share my screen, but there were analyses in the paper. I'll just paste the link in the in the um, in the chat. And if you can't access it because I'm actually on my work computer, um, I will also paste the open access version. Just in case, I, I never know. So this is the open access version. I just, yeah, just to be sure that every con can access the paper. So this is Many Babies Bilingual. There were some analyses on SES if you want to follow up and I, they will also have some follow-up reading. But yeah, it's a complex issue. Sorry for, for, for blabbing on um, <laughs> about this, but yeah, just to highlight that, yeah, there's so much going into these and so many considerations. Um, Joanna, I see you have your hand up. Sorry. Hi, thanks. So I came a bit late from the other session, but I'm really glad I did because, you know, even to the last sort of session, um, half an hour has been really fascinating. Um, and I just wanted to kind of follow up with the uh, bilingualism. Um, there's a really, um, I don't really work on them, but I sort of know a few people in a really good lab looking at baby uh, language development in Edinburgh University. And I know that there are specifically, they, they sort of stopped looking at bilingual children from different language background. And they were only focusing on specific languages because there's enough differences within the language. And I wonder whether um, you're finding kind of the same with that German, are you just focusing specifically on um, those groups, which there'll be differences in the language that they speak because of the kind of other backgrounds, other factors in as well. And you know, and then whether there's any um, kind of comparison of, of uh, um, the, the languages themselves as well. So I don't know much about language development, but I just, um, I just kind of remembered about this. Yeah. Yes, you're right. Actually, it, it really matters. The language combination matters a lot and the, the amount of language. So, so uh, the, the work I know here from my colleagues um, on, for example, Dutch German bilingual state, that was really on the sound level because Dutch and German, they're really closely related. Uh, so. They always say just speak like with a hot potato in your mouth when you're German <laughs> and then you can speak Dutch and right there different language pairs that work like this but there's still some systematic differences and they examined those so for those of course you need to control the languages um, but um, even there you find a lot of heterogeneity um, according to the amount of exposure people or children have and then when you go beyond this and, and mix language pairs right then if you look at specific language effects, you can't isolate them anymore, basically. But if you look, for example, what other people do, look at the effect of just, just knowing two languages, what does it do to your brain? Then you can look at different languages. And um, But specifically within many babies, actually, we only so far looked at the North American English effect. So having a specific amount of North American English in your daily life, does it increase your response to these North American stimuli? And the answer is yes. But you could, for example, look at whether the second language, because that's been recorded, that's actually in the data. You could um, explore more um, whether, for example, uh, if your second language is, is, is uh, Germanic or follows the same rhythmic pattern, because rhythm is a very big issue in infant directed speech, um, or whether it follows a different rhythmic pattern. So for example, if your second language is Japanese, right? Um, whether that makes a difference. Um, so that, that can be explored in the data too. Again, you don't need access to babies and you can do research. <laughs> so if you, yeah, if you know people who are curious, but yeah, we haven't done that yet. Um, and yeah, actually that's one of the, the cool things about many babies that you can do lots of baby research without babies. I see another hand raised. 
or I hope that's that's the answering your your question. Okay. Yeah, yeah, great, thanks. Yeah. Uh, so my question is a bit basic, I think. I was wondering if there's any any reason why we are so inclined to use infant uh, directed speech is that a biological reason or is it is it just cultural um can you talk a little bit about that um it's a great question it's not basic at all because we're still discussing it <laughs> um so what we do know is that it varies by language not whether there's infant directed speech people really think there's infant directed speech across languages but for example this fact that you talk with a higher voice might not work in every language because some languages actually use how high or the voice height to convey meaning. So you can't uh, do it um, um, the same way. In some languages you would, for example, uh, duplicate words much more. Um, so, so the way you adapt your speech changes by language, but that's cultural. But the fact that you do speak differently to babies seems to be something that is, at least uh, when people have looked closely, something that happens across the board. Although they are still debated reports of cultures that do not speak to their babies. These babies learn language usually from children, they say, um, instead of adults. Um, but then again, these children talk differently to, to babies than to adults. So there's still some, oh uh, yeah. It's, it's, um, but even within a language and culture, there are differences between people. So um, again, individuals differ. Why do they do that? Uh, it's horrible. Uh, we, psychology would be so much easier, right, without individual differences. Um, but the way or the amount of infodirected speech actually differs um, by person. Some of that is because there's still the myth out there that, that using a special voice with your baby is bad. So uh, some midwives actually still say that or nurses. It's, it's really, it's, yeah. And some people feel awkward doing it. Actually, I felt really awkward when, when because I, I did all this research and when I had my baby, I was really like, you're a one day old and I will talk, baby talk to you now. And this baby is just like, um, so it's hard. <laughs> and we also know, um, so there's this, of course, it's, it's, it's weird in the beginning if you really try to do it, um, but it's, it's natural when they're old and actually talk back. Um, it's easy, <laughs> it gets easier. Um, and um, the other thing is that actually there's also a feedback loop. So some babies, for example, don't respond to infant directed speech because they have a hearing impairment. People talk differently to babies with hearing impairments. So there's also this, again, babies actually being an active participant in their development. So there, there's at least three parts. There's the cultural aspect, and that's linked to language. There's the individual aspect, actually how, how ready are you to use this kind of speech? And then there's the baby aspect. Um, so that's my answer. Um, that's what we know right now. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, why? Yeah, so some people say it's easier. So you automatically do it because it's easier. And some people say it's actually just, it's a socio-emotional thing. And it's, yeah. Some, and, and yeah, I, I, just, I am strongly believing in, in the, the feedback loop thing as well happening. Of course, you talk in a way that makes baby happy because you want happy baby, don't want cry baby. I mean, at least I do. Yeah. Yes, oh my God, pet directed speech is a whole thing. And did you know that you talk to younger pets differently than older pets? That's true. <laughs> But yeah, we do talk differently to pets too. It's different from infant directed speech, interestingly enough. What I also find uh, funny with uh, pets that because I am originally from Russia and living in Austria. So when I'm in Russia, I'm speaking Russian to, to, the, to any pets. And when I'm in Austria, I don't feel without somehow comfortable speaking to them Russian. I'm always speaking German to them. And I, I just recognized it at one point. I was like, why am I doing it? <laughs> but I was like, no, they, else they will not understand me. I need to speak uh, German. And it's kind of, I find it's fascinating what our brain does. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, sometimes without really much reflection, some, some things just happen. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. But pet directed speech is fun too. Yeah. It's, people study it. 
people do acoustic recordings and then check it. So it's, it's yeah. So I think all of these questions are great. Bilingual pets, yeah, I'm sure they exist. I'm sure they exist. Because right there are these, these trained pets that are trained with German signals, because I don't know why German sounds so mean. Um, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure, so I'm pretty sure I have seen a talk once, a group in Hungary that put dogs into fMRI scanner breathing cool dogs, and I think they responded differently to um, uh, you know, comments or instructions in Hungarian or German something, so I'm pretty sure they do exist. I'm not surprised. The dogs are remarkably good with language. Um, there's, yeah, they're dog labs studying dog uh, cognition specifically. I think there might be a many dogs too. I mean, there's many primates. I think there is many dogs already. So join it. <laughs> there's many, yeah, there's many lots of things. But I think many dogs is many birds, I think, is there as well. Because there are some birds also with remarkable language. Yes, many dogs. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I'm allergic. I can only do many labradoodles. I would be down for many labradoodles. Oh, you're lucky you have a species you can tolerate. I haven't tried, but I hope, right? Because they're supposedly better. No? Not for me. I need to try. I haven't cuddled with one. Yeah. That's always the test. Cuddling and then checking. How would you get? It's very tragic. I was going to ask about your sort of um, authorship policies. How are you guys handling that? Yes, amazing question. So um, still figuring it out. Many Babies One was a consortium paper. So if you if you look, um, it says the Many Babies consortium, consortium I think, um, okay. or collaboration. How, how do you find the pros and cons of that? Yeah, so... This is really, it's nice because it doesn't, doesn't, at least it prevents, for example, accidental second authorship because my name is Berkman, right? Um, mm -hmm. So at least that's fine. And it also, um, but it, it, it did get added to our Google Scholar pages, but it, um, in the end, we, we decided that the cons outweighed the pros because especially ECRs, um, are undervalued in this kind of authorship model and um, key contributions are also not as easy to highlight um, in this authorship model. So just a consortium um, is hard. So we, we switched with most follow-up projects to full author names list, which is a pain. Um, but what we're doing with Many Babies at Home, because it has, um, for example, the specific feature that there are some contributions that are um, not project specific, like translating the platform so making it possible that you collect data for with people who do not speak English. So we now have a Japanese look at, yay. Um, that, that will be useful across projects. So basically those people will be part of a list that is added to papers as plus the Many Babies at Home Consortium, um, but they will be named authors as well. So basically penultimate author or so will be Many Babies at Home and then all others will be named authors. Um, but that's something we're just figuring out with many babies at home, actually, and others um, have solved it differently, but most have reverted back to full named authorship. Um, because, I mean, you can still have right full contribution tracking um, with both, but it, it's just much easier to, to prove authorship this way. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's difficult and it's an ongoing debate. So... Yeah. Somewhere where there's a lot of policies that need some pushback as well. Mm -hmm. Like one of the PSA projects, PNAS said, um, the authorship list of I think 457 authors was gonna count towards the word count. I heard about that. Yeah. That's <laughs> so, bad. It, it, that, that's just ridiculous. Um, that's not cool. Yeah. yeah. 
But I mean, we didn't get into PNAS yet, so we didn't even try. We didn't think we could, but yeah, I'm so glad. But <laughs> um, yeah, but then this kind of like hybrid might be nice that you basically, but again, what is what is a core collaborator or what is a core author and, and what is a consortium member, right? This, this, this cutoff might also be difficult to make and um, also tracking contribution and, and the importance of it over time. Right? You always have a bias towards who helps with the final push, but the person who basically set up everything two years ago, other than just a name in the con consortium list. So it's really, it's, 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 it all comes with, with issues. Um, so I think, yeah. But uh, right now, just having thought more about this hybrid, I like it because it kind of, um, it, it, for example, gives a, a nice place to RAs um, who have collected data. So yeah, they did contribute, but they have not really done this full intellectual ownership thing that classically is required. Um, so it, it might also ease the burden towards authorship or ease the, ease the hurdle, lower the hurdle. That's the one I was looking for, towards authorship. Um, that's my, yeah, right now I like this, um, but I don't know where we'll end up. It's, it's really... I have a whole document <laughs> with, with um, pros and cons of different authorship models. Um, we haven't figured it out, basically. But yeah, PSA, right? Um, they have named authorship. Full full list of name, no? Yeah. yeah. And, and right, Many Labs has more like... The, the first was Klein and all, right? I don't know. It, it varies. Yeah, I, th I think most of them have a kind of consortium authorship plus the... Um... The leads yeah. are individually named, but the PSA is pretty dedicated to um, fully named authorship, never consortium, and it's part of our um, agreement documents with with lead labs. 